so I'm going to talk today about uh, work that we've been doing, working on monitoring ecosystems at very large scales using airborne remote sensing and computer vision. And I'm going to start by introducing the key ideas using work we've been doing monitoring wading birds in the Everglades. And then I'll talk about our efforts to generalize these approaches to birds and hopefully animals more broadly. And along the way, I'll talk about the infrastructure that we're using for doing this. Uh, the Everglades is a spectacular and unique ecosystem that was severely impacted by human activity and that the government is now spending billions of dollars to restore. And many of the associated restoration benchmarks have to do with these large wading bird colonies that form in the Everglades each spring, including things like the number of birds, what species they are, where they're located, and the timing and success of reproductive events. But measuring these benchmarks is hard because the ecosystem is thousands of square miles in area, basically the southern quarter of Florida, and the colony locations are scattered across this expanse. And so historically, the large-scale monitoring has involved flying small airplanes around and looking out the windows to try to count the number of birds in a colony, or taking pictures out of a window with a handheld camera and then bringing those back to the lab, trying to overlap them, and then counting them for birds when you get back. Counting the hundreds of thousands of birds that are in the Everglades. And as you can imagine, trying to count and identify this many birds this way is both highly air prone and highly laborious. And so for the past three years, I've been part of an interdisciplinary team that has been flying an unoccupied aircraft system, otherwise known as a drone, uh, over a number of colonies and developing computer vision-based approaches to counting birds. Uh, for the hardware folks in the room, uh, this is a DJI Inspire quadcopter that we're flying with a 24 megapixel camera, uh, flying automated flight paths at about 300 feet with 80% overlap between images. And so that results in hundreds to thousands of individual photographs per colony. We then combine all of these images together into a single ortho mosaic giving us a complete overview of the individual tree island where the birds are located uh, with about one centimeter positional accuracy. And if we zoom in, we can see that we start to see birds uh, in this tree island. And at maximum zoom, we can see grainy but obvious images of birds sitting on nests. And this graininess is actually primarily a byproduct of that orthomosaic process, not the resolution of the imagery itself. So that's pretty cool, right? We're collecting terabytes of imagery, but how do we go from all of these pictures to data on the abundance and location of birds, the things that we want to study as ecologists and the things that, that the managers need to know for planning? The first thing we do is we start by creating a large data set of hand-labeled images because, as we know, the kinds of convolutional neural network models that we're working with in computer vision tend to be quite data hungry. Uh, and so far, we've labeled about 5,000 image crops containing over 50,000 individual birds for training this model. And Hilmar said, you all were really interested in infrastructure, and I am certainly really interested in infrastructure myself, so you're going to get to hear about infrastructure today. Uh, and so we are doing this labeling right now using an open source, source Python package called Label Studio, uh, running on one of my lab servers. We've tried a number of different approaches to labeling over the last three years, and we like Label Studio the best because it's easy to work with from both an end user and system administration perspective. 
it's centralized so we can have lots of folks labeling things simultaneously uh, and it has a nice built-in collaboration system as well. We're using bounding boxes. That's our, our form of labeling, but I know some of the work that you all are working on requires more fine-grained labeling, uh, and Label Studio supports a range of labeling tasks, including semantic segmentation and key point labeling, uh, and it also supports integration with computer vision models for active learning approaches. That's something we're, we're doing more and more on, getting the humans in the loop. Okay, so once we have labels, and this is where the traditional computer vision talk starts, we need a model, right? And this is what we often spend most of our time talking about in computer vision. So we're using a RetinaNet 50 one-stage object detector. It's got a ResNet 50 backbone. Uh, it uses Feature Pyramid Network to learn features at multiple scales. And it uses focal loss to help address a very common issue in biological computer vision, which is class imbalance, right? So we have lots of pictures of one thing and not very many pictures of most of the others. And as you'll see in a minute, this works quite well, but lots of models would work pretty well here. And, and something I hope you take away from uh, my talk and our conversation today is that model choice is just a single piece of a much larger puzzle for this kind of work. So we take these labeled images and we train this model on that labeled data. Uh, we're training on uh, an NVIDIA a100 GPU cluster here at the University of Florida where we name everything after gators, including the high performance machine. Uh, we can train this whole model in three to four hours on a single GPU, uh, faster if we needed to scale to multiple GPUs for some reason. And overall, the model performs really well when it comes to counting birds. Uh, we've got 87% precision and 87% recall. Uh, and these numbers are really good in and of themselves. Uh, but when we go in and we look at instances where the model is confused, it's hard to blame the model because it's these very difficult things where we've got a highly pixelated bird underneath a branch. And these things are difficult for humans to label, uh, let alone uh, for the computer to, to identify. Since our use case is counting birds, this is the graph that we really care about. Uh, so we've got, if you count up all the birds that the model detected and you compare it to the actual number of birds in the image, actual number on the Y, machine counted on the X, uh, we can see that we're really good at counting birds. With a slight overestimation up here at the top end, which is due to the annoying behavior of white ibis, which like to sit right next to one another, combined with the non-max suppression step uh, in detection. And so uh, this is something we, we know what's going on and we're working on fixing uh, these situations where neighboring birds get counted uh, as a single bird. We can also do the same thing well counting individual species. Uh, so this is the same figure as before. Machine counts on the X, human counts on the Y. We've broken things out by species now. Uh, the species classification precision and recall is generally quite good, which leads to good counts uh, of individual species. And so we can do a good job of estimating population sizes with the exception of our friend the snowy egret down here, which is a common difficult problem in computer vision. We've got few labels combined with the fact that it looks very similar to white ibis, which is the dominant class uh, in this data set. And so we're working on some things here, but this is a tough problem to get around. Okay. So overall, this is great, right? We're happy with ourselves. We can write a paper. Uh, we'll be famous in the ecology computer vision world of like 25 people, most of whom are on this call. Uh, but our real goal here isn't building a good model. Our real goal 
is in conducting near real-time monitoring of tens to hundreds of thousands of birds. And that means we need infrastructure to help us handle prediction. And this is a broad outline of our current system. Imagery from the field uh, is synced uh, daily, the day of collection, to the cloud. We use Dropbox because it's both easy for the field team and the university has unlimited storage, so we can stuff terabytes of imagery up there without worrying about it. That data from the cloud is then synced down to a local workstation in the lab where we do the one piece of this process that really requires uh, a human to do something, and that's combining all of those individual images into an orthomosaic. That orthomosaic, as soon as it's complete, is then automatically synced uh, again through the cloud onto our high performance system uh, where most of our computer vision work happens. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that in a minute. And then once that work is done, uh, it is pushed uh, onto uh, web visualization platforms uh, so that we can see what's coming out on the other side. On the HPC, behind me here, you can see we do a number of things that aren't just the computer vision step. We have to do uh, geospatial projection work. We do the actual computer vision pieces. We are also doing work detecting and processing nests as opposed to birds uh, and uh, pushing varying forms of uh, graphical information to uh, different parts of the web. So this is basically what allows for web some of the web optimized viewing uh, that I'll show uh, in a minute. And so there's a fair bit of stuff going on here. And to manage all of this, we use Snakemake, uh, which is an open source Python based workflow system. We like Snakemake because it's based in a language that lots of scientists use, right? So I don't have to teach someone a completely new workflow system. And it makes it easy to continually update our analyses. So as new data comes in and as we improve our models, everything gets rerun that needs to get rerun, but only the parts of this workflow that need to be rerun go. Uh, and it also simplifies scaling substantially. So if you can run this on your home machine, you can run it on the high performance cluster. Uh, dramatically scaled up. And so the end result of this is that within about 24 hours of new data coming in from the field, we can have updated results on the web. And if everything goes well, we'll take a look at what that looks like. Okay, good. We're live on the internet here. Uh, let's uh, take Cypress City here as an example. So this is the last three years of data. The, the new season is just starting. And if we just look at 2020 here for an example, we have the counts of birds over time and imagery down here. And we know where this is. This is actually up uh, by Fort Lauderdale for those of you who know Florida. And if we look through time, we can see the progression of the colony. So in 2020, we flew early enough that the birds hadn't really established yet. There's a few birds sitting around, but no real colony formation. A couple weeks later, the colony is starting to form. We're seeing abundances increase. The birds are looking around and picking where they're going to nest for the year. And then by early March, we've got we've reached this peak abundance for the season. This is basically what the colony is going to look like. These are the birds that are going to breed on this island. Uh, and we can zoom in uh, and take a look at, at how we're doing. Um, here's a couple of roseate spoonbills correctly identified. These are like the dream sort of thing for a computer vision model. They're pink. They have a very distinct spoon-shaped bill. We're probably going to be pretty good at those. Uh, if we scroll over a little bit, this is a uh, correctly identified great blue heron. 
they're darker. They tend to blend into the background more, so they're a little trickier. Our recall's a little lower here, kind of down in the 70s instead of the 90s. Um, but we've got this one effectively. Uh, and then if we, let's see, scroll down here just a little bit, we've got some great egrets, which are very common at the site. You can even see a little bit of this sort of splaying. Uh, these are the, the classic breeding feathers of great egrets, which if you haven't seen them, you should Google great egret breeding plumage uh, here in the background and, and see what's going on with these feathers because they're pretty cool. And so in the Everglades, we're starting to, I think, realize the potential for computer vision to let us conduct ecology at scales and with frequencies uh, that we couldn't otherwise really imagine, right? We're basically doing weekly surveys now of tens of thousands of birds across a number of different colonies. And we're really interested in figuring out how to facilitate these kinds of benefits in the biological sciences more broadly. And we can do this by transferring the kinds of things that we've learned here in a variety of ways. First, we can leverage the fact that the kinds of neural nets that we're working with tend to exhibit decent transfer, right? Because they're designed to learn general features of what a bird looks like. And so a model designed to find birds in the Everglades may be able to help find birds in other systems. And we looked at this by pulling together data from a dozen other projects. So this includes everything from West African terns to seabirds from the South Pacific to chinstrap penguins from Antarctica. And we looked to see how well we could detect birds in an ecosystem by training on the other ecosystems, but using no training data from the system that we were predicting on. And the results were generally encouraging. So this is just two examples. Orange boxes here are human labels and blue boxes are the neural net with no access to the system being predicted. The algorithm finds a lot of birds from species and backgrounds it haven't, hasn't trained on, but it also does some funny things like identifying these shadows as birds. Though to be fair, they are bird shaped. Uh, and uh, it also struggles quite a bit with the, this combination of bird color and background where the birds blend into the background a bit in a way that they haven't seen before, that the model hasn't seen before. The good news is that if we give the neural net just a few labels from the actual site, things get a lot better. So this is, these are the same predictions, but now the algorithm's been fine-tuned on a thousand labels from the focal site, right? So we fit on everything else, we fine-tune on a thousand labels from the focal site. And now it's learned to ignore shadows uh, and it does a better job of dealing with this challenging uh, background that it hadn't seen before. And this, example reflects the general results. If we apply a bird detector with no local training data, we get a wide range of accuracies. These are F1s here. Uh, in cases where there's been some similar-ish system that the model's been trained on, it does a really good job, right? We're in the ballpark of what we're accomplishing in the Everglades with 50,000 labels. If it's totally different, all of a sudden we're looking at penguins in Antarctica and there's no version of that in the data anywhere, uh, then the model doesn't do very well. If we fine tune, things get a lot better. The upper end is still pretty much the same, but now the lower limit of accuracy is getting into a much more acceptable range. And one of the interesting things, uh, especially if you're not used to how data hungry these models are, 
is that if you build local models with only that thousand local labels, then we do much worse than just using this general bird detector with no local labels, almost invariably. Uh, and in fact, this takes a tremendous amount of work to actually get the models to fit effectively because they just don't want to fit most of the time. Okay, so we can transfer models at least a bit, and that's pretty cool. Uh, but we can transfer more than model weights. And so once we have models that work, we should think about how to make it easier for others to work with them. Because as Hilmar mentioned at the beginning, not every biologist has access to the computing and machine learning expertise that's necessary to do this sort of stuff. And so to make this easier for others to benefit from, we've been developing tools to make this approach easier to engage with. Uh, and so if you wanna make predictions using this bird detector trained on a dozen different systems, uh, and you wanna use it on your own data, you can do that with four lines of Python right now uh, using our deep forest package. And if you wanna fine tune on your own data, it goes up to about 20 lines. Uh, and so this is sort of bringing the computer vision a little bit closer uh, to the to biologists as a whole. And we can take this sort of transfer of knowledge one step further by directly providing the predictions of the computer vision model as data products. And we're almost ready to start doing this for the birds. We like to spend a fair bit of time making sure that the models are giving us good enough predictions that we're comfortable thinking about them as data, uh, but we're already doing it in similar work on trees. And so uh, in this other work, we have identified the size and location of 100 million trees uh, in the US that are all part of the National Ecological Observatory Network, uh, sites ranging from Puerto Rico to Alaska. And this is the kind of information that's incredibly useful for ecological analyses, right? We've got a ton of individual tree locations and sizes. But it's not the kind of work that many ecology teams have the expertise or computing resources to reproduce themselves. And so we're publishing these model outputs as data products in both geospatial and CSV-based formats with the idea that anyone who can work with spatial data on trees collected in the field can also work with remotely sensed information on trees collected at much larger scales. And so I think this is an important final step uh, in the kinds of workflows that I outlined earlier in order to make the information generated by computer vision as broadly useful as possible. Just a brief note on next steps. Uh, we're now working on generalizing the species identification components of these pipelines. So that generalization work before, that's just counting birds. Like you're either a bird or you're not a bird. Uh, we can't tell you what species uh, of bird it is, and so this is trickier. Uh, it's more about engineering useful features than it is about having a full-blown uh, network, but we're working on that. Uh, one of the folks, things that I love about this group uh, is that you all are really focused on getting beyond just this is this thing when it comes to looking at images. And we're doing that same sort of thing in the ecology space. We're trying to get towards using this remote sensing to give us out information on nest success, so the actual sort of reproductive biology of the species in the system. Uh, and then lastly, we're starting to get into how do we transfer these kinds of end-to-end -end workflows effectively, right? Because we've got a lot of tools here. They work in concert with one another. They have to run end-to-end -to, -end to give us an effective system. How do we transfer that kind of usage to uh, the field more broadly? And then I'll just highlight a few of the many folks involved in this. Uh, Morgan Ernest is the other PI uh, on this project and is responsible for the field component, including uh, 
keeping the drones in the air. Uh, Lindsay Garner, who's our, our lead field manager uh, and handles the drones and gets to spend every day in the Everglades for six months a year. Uh, ben Weinstein uh, leads all the computer vision work uh, in the group. Uh, and then Henry Sinyando, uh, who leads the, the workflow development component of things that I talked about today. And uh, with that, I will uh, take any questions and I have also brought along some discussion prompts as requested.